Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. We're really happy to be partnering with Amsterdam JS Nation, a JavaScript conference happening on the 6th of June this year. They have some stellar speakers lined up, including Kyle Simpson, author of the You Don't Know JS book series, Babel creator Henry Zhu, and the author of Webpack, Tobias Coppers. You really shouldn't miss this conference, so make sure you use the discount code Web Platform Podcast to get 15% off tickets. So follow the link in the show notes to find out more. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Web Platform Podcast. Hey, I've got my voice back. Magic. This week, it's episode number 187. Today, we're talking about WebRTC and the interesting updates we've had with that. We are your hosts this week, Justin Rebarrow and Leon Revel. Leon, hello. Uh, Justin, glad to have you back. I'm glad you uh, got over your cold, etc. Well, I got it from you. I mean, sure, we're three <laughs> something thousand miles apart. Uh, I don't know how many kilometers that is because, eh, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we we apparently were both sick roughly about the same time. Uh, sadly, I lost my voice and uh, and and did not get to be here last week, which made me sad. But I'm back, yay! So good to see you. And uh, exciting things this week uh, to talk about WebRTC. But before we get to that, we're going to throw it over to Leon, who's going to talk about this week in the web in two minutes or less. Leon. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, so first of all, uh, Ivan Yu uh, gave an update on Vue.js at the Vue.js conference in Amsterdam. So check out the video on YouTube to find out all of the latest on Vue. Um, so Mozilla has just announced a new project called um, Iodide, uh, which is a tool that basically allows you to visualize, um, share, and explore data for data scientists uh, directly in the browser. So that's really cool, especially with the um, uh, more and more interest, more and more people being interested in big data and machine learning and data visualization. Those kind of tools are going to kind of really help with those kind of things. Um, and recently on the show, we talked about CSS Houdini. Um, so I wanted to share CSS-Houdini.rocks. So it's a site with some fantastic examples and use cases for the APIs. So if you're still not sure exactly what you could do with Houdini, then check out this website because there's some really cool examples on there. Um, I particularly like the latest inner borders example. So check out the link to find out. Uh, some of those examples. Um, and at Google this announced dynamic mail for Gmail. Um, basically, you'll start to see richer, more interactive content from within mail for supporting applications. So the example that they use is instead of getting um, multiple emails for each uh, Google Doc comment, um, you'll basically be able to see an up-to-date list of comments and be able to respond directly from inside email. So that seems pretty cool. Not tried it out yet, but looking forward to seeing it. Um, and Redmonk has published their latest programming language rankings report. Wix has JavaScript at the very top and also a rising TypeScript. So check out the report for all of the details. And that's everything from me for this week in web. Thank you, Leon. Interesting things. The dynamic mail thing, I, I, I'm, I'm curious about. <laughs> Little tiny web apps. Uh, apparently, it's an amp. So I'm sure that will require, you know, some think pieces out there. But we're not talking today about AMP. Today we're talking about WebRTC. And WebRTC, for those who've been around WebRTC for a while, uh, you know, has gone through its iterations. And today we're getting an update from our guest this week, Mr. Levant Levy. Sir, welcome to the show. So glad to have you. Hi, glad to be here. So for those who don't know you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Yeah, you didn't hack my name because you didn't say <laughs> Well, I didn't want I I was going to let you tackle that, you know. I had already hacked the the beginning of this week in web, which Leon will never let me live down at this point, so that was a good choice. Um, my name is, <laughs> my name is Tahil Vent Levy. Um I've been in the voice over IP space for the last 20 years, something like that. And I've always been fascinated with WebRTC from the moment it it was published some 7 8 years ago. Um, it also got me to where I am, which is living, being an employee at a company as a CTO of a business unit that deals with voice over IP products, and then going and becoming a consultant in this space. And today I consult around WebRTC, communication, CPaaS, you know, communication platform as a service, and a bit around machine learning and AI within the same space, same domain. Um, I'm also co-founder and CEO of a company called TestRTC, 
where we offer testing and monitoring services for WebRTC applications. Uh, and I wrote, I wrote about WebRTC and other topics on my blog, Blog Geekme. Oh, and one last, thing, one last thing, I always forget that because it only happened this year. Apparently, I'm also the W3C evangelist for everything that's WebRTC related. Fantastic. So what's it like being an evangelist for <laughs> WebRTC? Because I... you talked about being in the business of VoIP for a long time, and VO, uh, voice over IP has changed a lot over the years, it seems like. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's like asking me what it's like to be 40. I don't know. It's the same as being 39. <laughs> um, I don't know. I really don't know. It's interesting. And I have another title that I can you know, go and, and show. Uh, but we'll see. It means that I have more, let's say, more accessibility to the people within W3C today that are sitting and dealing with the specification itself of WebRTC. So speaking of that, uh... Maybe a quick introduction of uh, WebRTC is in order because uh, a lot of web developers may have probably heard of WebRTC, but I, I'm not sure a lot of people have used it. Uh, it, it, it is a very specific sort of niche uh, sort of thing. So uh, why, if, what's the yeah. sort of high level overview of WebRTC for those who don't know what a WebRTC is? Okay, so WebRTC allows us to use voice and video communications, real-time voice and video communications within a web browser without any installation at all, okay? Now, if I go to the technical level, WebRTC is two parts. It's a kind of a media engine that was built and embedded into a browser that has a JavaScript API that is known and standardized on top of it. So now developers can build whatever they want that require being able to send voice and video from one browser to another. Now note that everything I talked about now is a browser, and that's because that's the specification side of the story. That's if you look at WebRTC and say, well, this is an HTML5 you know, specification that we need to go and implement or use. On the other hand, when WebRTC came out, Google just went out, put a website on the world out there called webrtc.org, and there you can find the open source that gets embedded into the Chrome browser that is WebRTC. And this was the first time that you had, or the, you know, the instance in time that you now have an open source media engine, which is high quality, commercial grade, integrated virtually everywhere today, that you can use for whatever purpose you want. So you see people taking it and porting it to mobile and putting it inside their own applications. You see others doing the same for native applications on a PC. You see people taking Electron, which is you know a layer on top of Chromium, and building PC applications with it that are cross-platform between Mac, Linux, and Windows. And you see those that say, well, I just need an echo canceler, or I just need a specific codec, or a jitter buffer, or a piece of code and they grab it out of WebRTC and put it elsewhere because they need it. So that, for me, is WebRTC in a way. So when you when you say it's kind of virtually available everywhere, kind of what kind of platform support we're looking at at the moment? And I'm sure we'll get into the details in a little bit, just kind of a rough overview as to um, where you can use WebRTC in the state it's in now. So today you have the four, all four major browsers support it. That would be Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Microsoft Edge. It doesn't exist in, in, in Internet Explorer, but that browser doesn't really exist today. I don't think that you've talked about it in this show in the last 100 episodes. Um, then it runs across all of the operating systems where you find these browsers, almost. What do I mean almost? In iOS, for example, Firefox and Chrome wouldn't support WebRTC today, but Safari does. So on each and every mobile and desktop type of a device that you would use or that you are going to use, WebRTC is available. On top of that, there are a lot of applications that use it in internally, and it's not related to if there is a browser or not. And these applications can run, again, on mobile devices, tablets, um, set of boxes, you know, smart TVs, everything. And they can also run on IoT devices because someone decided to 
take whatever, you know, take the component of WebRTC or implement it and just embed it into that kind of a device. So you have a few surveillance cameras that support WebRTC today, which means that you can go install them and just reach out to them with a browser and see what goes on there. Cool. So it really is in quite a lot of places then. So um, even though, as Justin says, you know, there isn't a, a huge number of developers which are using WebRTC, perhaps. Um, but I think I think it's fair to say that a lot of people will be uh, using it from a com consumer perspective day by day. Could you give us an example of just a few applications that most people would um, would use that utilizes their technology? Well, Facebook Messenger, Slack, voice and video in Slack are WebRTC. Discord uses WebRTC for voice and video. Google Hangouts, obviously. Skype is moving towards WebRTC now, which is why you've got, if you go to web.skype.com with a Chrome browser or, or an Edge browser, you can actually do a video call from there. And that's uses, using WebRTC. House Party uses it within their application. Snapchat, WebEx, GoToMeeting. Did I miss anyone? <laughs> Quite quite a few then. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's safe to say that most people that that use the internet today will be using WebRTC from a from a kind of day to day basis. Yes, I'll give you also two other stupid examples. Okay, there's if you use let's say Mailchimp. Okay. Yep. And you've created to be nice, and you're like me. You've got you know OCD, and you can't have things that aren't aligned perfectly. So you created an account on Mailchimp to send emails. And then you made to you went to fill out your profile information and you need to put a profile image. There are two ways you can do that. One is upload the image, the second one is just take a picture. Ah, cool, yeah. Taking a picture uses a WebRTC API to do that. It's not sending the communication over the internet, but they grab your image from there. Um, there is the um, common voices, something like that from Mozilla. The project that they've done a year or two ago or started a year or two ago where they are asking people to contribute their voice they give you the sentences to speak and then you speak it up and they store it and now they release the data set and you can just do speech to text with it and things like that so the whole process of getting the audio from the browser is done using webrtc again so there are a lot of areas where you have webrtc that it's not really communication or not really a person to another person it is something else. So a lot of times, you know, in, in the years of old, you know, it, it may seem odd now for people to not use WebRTC, um, but that was not always the case, right? We, 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 used to, we used to have plugins on the web and they were usually flash and it was a terrible sort of thing because they did not run everywhere. Um, and then WebRTC sort of came around as a spec and things sort of uh, started to unify in terms of the way things ideally should work um as webrtc has sort of moved to 1.0 um you know what have been some of the roadblocks there because it, while we have the standard and the spec not all things were at one point interoperable in the webrtc spec or i'm sorry not in the spec but rather the implementation uh in various browsers and things how does that look now as we sort of reach towards 1.0 well, we're not at 1.0 yet. And sadly, we're probably probably not going to be there this year, although there are intentions and there is a lot of work to getting WebRTC to 1.0, okay? Uh, 1.0 doesn't exist today from W3C, so there is no WebRTC specification, okay? Now, the funny thing is that you can find RFCs in the ITF that are obviously workable only if you use WebRTC. So everyone feels and acts as if WebRTC is a done deal. And now it's only the minor parts of closing the specification, make sure, making sure that everything is aligned, finding two implementations that are interoperable with it, building the test suite around that, you know, the things that you do when you build browsers. Um, the browsers themselves, though, are not 1.0 compliant yet. And in the last year or so, you've seen, we've seen browsers starting to slowly move towards the 1.0 specification, which meant starting to change their API, then deprecating parts, and you know, moving slowly that way. Uh, and this is causing or wreaking a lot of havoc around the web. Uh, you see a lot of breakages of, of services, especially those that are too old. 
and with each release of Chrome, for example, something breaks with WebRTC. Now it sounds bad, and it is bad, but it's a lot better than where we've been before, and it is getting better. So we are going the, the let's say that at the end of the day, it's, it's reasonable that this is happening today. It's like you needed jQuery years ago and now you don't really need it, but you still use it because people used it then. So it's the same, the same type of uh, approach. I, I guess the biggest hurdle in the past, at least for WebRTC, was the part of codec selection. Is it going to be H.264 or VP8? Then they decided that both of them are going to be there. And then with time, all browsers actually implemented both, you know, implemented WebRTC and implemented both uh, variation, both video codecs within the browsers. So we're at a point that people can use WebRTC. Uh, now, if you want to develop with it, you need to be extremely aware that at the end of the day, this is going to be a journey and not a destination. It's not as if you say, I'm going to add WebRTC today. It's going to take me two months, three months of a project, half a year. Once I'm done, I'm going to see video, it's working, it's fine, and now I can go and you know do something else. No, you need to continue investing time and effort in making sure that you know that it is running. And this is going to be the case for the next one or two years at least. I feel like it's that way for a lot of things. WebRCC seems to really sort of uh, amplify that though, uh, in particular with the video code side of life. Um, because I think only recently Safari said, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Safari had said that they were going to implement VP8. Um, so uh, it doesn't seem unreasonable to me. I mean, again, as you note, it was way worse before this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, in terms of interoperability uh, across uh, quite literally anything, <laughs> browser okay. versions, uh, you know, platforms, you name it, it was not a particularly interoperable time. Um, well, I worked for 13 years at a video conferencing company before WebRTC. I have scars all over my body, <laughs> okay, from the things you need to do to get video actually running. So things are a lot better today. We're just a bit more pampered. We expect it to work better than it can in one way. And at the second part, it is unstable because things change all the time. And it changes because of... You know, the clash between standardization, politics, and developers. And somewhere in there, we get lost along the way and the things that need to be done. Well, it is interesting, too, because when you when you sort of look at WebRTC and, you know, once you start talking, once the word video Kodak comes into play, all of a sudden you, you, you now have hardware manufacturers chiming in <laughs> with their own subset of standards of, well, you know, we're not going to performance optimize that. Uh, but yeah. we will do this other one over here if you want. And then one's like, well, that's you can't do that. And then, yeah, that argument seems to stretch. <laughs> yes, and then there's the other part, unrelated to that at all. Okay, take a web, web developer, give him WebRTC and tell him, you know, go work, build something with it. The point in time in which he will understand that he needs to add, you know, a bunch of new servers that do things that he never thought are needed or possible, to build this thing that he's doing, and no, it's not going to use the same sockets and ports and HTTP connections that you are using. It's going to do something totally different that will boggle his mind. So there's a lot of new terminology and technology that needs to be, uh, let's say, learned and used if you are going to need to adopt WebRTC. So um, if like, WebRTC is still in this kind of uh, initial sub 1.0 kind of state, um, kind of why should developers still be interested in learning WebRTC? Kind of what, what, are, the, what are the reasons why you know, it, it's worth all of the, the hassle, if you like? Well, there are two things. First of all, it's the most interesting thing out there, if you ask me. OK, security is, is just so boring. And then you've got AI and analytics and data science, which is very interesting, but too much math. And then what else do you have? I don't know, infrastructure, scaling, front end. WebRTC has it all. Uh, that's one. And then you see things with your eyes. It works, it works, it doesn't work. There is a lot of beauty that goes into building an architecture that uses WebRTC. Um, I don't know, I love it. Um, 
The second part, on a daily basis, I get requests from companies for me to find them developers. There aren't enough developers today to what entrepreneurs and companies want to build with WebRTC. And if you're good at it and you know what you're doing, you're most definitely going to find a job and you can choose the job that you want. Or let's say the application that you are going to work on. Yeah, and, and real-time communications, especially around kind of voice and video nowadays, are, are expected from a lot of a lot of systems and online applications. And having the knowledge to mm -hmm. be able to build those type of applications certainly will be valuable. And, and you're totally right in how um, you know how exciting WebRTC can be in terms of the the things that you can build with it, the how you know the, st the stuff you can see and create. Um, it's certainly one of those um, kind of sets of APIs which you know. I really kind of get excited about. Unfortunately, I haven't had a an opportunity to spend a lot of time with those particular APIs or build anything really cool yet. But it's certainly certainly one of the more interesting ones for sure. Um, so um, we talked kind of briefly about um, like version one point zero, and and you're saying that um, we, we probably shouldn't even expect it kind of this year. Um, but what uh, uh, what do you think? Um, what kind of uh, developments with WebRTC do you think we will see over this year? Hmm. So let's see, video conferencing is what we started with WebRTC. That was the first thing people did with it. You know, that uh, talking heads kind of applications. Then we move towards contact centers. A lot of contact centers today, this year and last year, started shifting the agents to use WebRTC. So you're going to call the contact center the way you did up until today. Nothing changes. You see a phone number, you dial that phone number from a regular phone, and someone is answering you on the other side from the contact center. The agent answering is actually doing that with WebRTC from inside the CRM. It's embedded into his CRM. Okay. Why is this important? Because now they can virtualize that workspace. They can tell him to work from home or a coffee shop and it doesn't need to go to the office. It's easier to maintain. It's easier to for the IT person to deal with. There's better integration points. So we see that happening now. On the front of development, ex developing exciting things, we started seeing things around live broadcasts. OK? I want to do a webinar to 1,000 people, but I want it to be in real time. I want to stream my video to 20,000 people because what I'm doing is playing a game and people are watching. And they want the people watching to be able to tell me things or ask me things to do. So they need it to be in real time. And you see that. Microsoft acquired a company called Beam and it is now called Mixer. It's part of Xbox and this is what they're doing. Then you've got things like uh, it was called Google Stream. And now I don't remember the new name the gaming platform that Google announced two weeks ago. Stadia? Stadia? Stadia. Stadia, yes, Stadia. That's WebRTC. OK. What they're doing there is saying, we're going to give you a game to play, but the game is not going to run locally. We're going to host it in the cloud. Why? Because you don't have that much of a good machine, and you might even want to you know, play out of a tablet or, or, or phone. And we're going to allow you to do that. What we are going to do is simply stream the video towards your device, and you're going to play it remotely. So in order to get the, the data, or let's say the video that is being rendered on the machine in the cloud towards your device, they use WebRTC for that. And your, let's say your window into the game is Chrome, the browser. Uh, so we start seeing these things, these live broadcasts and, and these types of applications happening as well. Um, We'll start seeing CDNs playing with WebRTC, both for ingress and egress. So if you look at what we're doing here for this podcast, we're recording it using WebRTC. At the end of the day, it's going to be uploaded to a CDN to be stre streamed from there with the usual HTTP player. OK. In the future, if, you, if we want to do it live, we can do it live with WebRTC both ends. And that's good for things like sport games. I don't want to see the goal 10 seconds after my neighbors. That's the main use case, or auctions, HQ trivia, uh, things where real time makes sense. Uh, we start seeing a look at uh, VR and AR. 
the funny thing, it doesn't happen today in consumer, it happens in the enterprise space with remote remote um, visual assistance. Okay, I can go and drive a truck remotely. I can go and watch a construction construction site remotely and interact with the people there. These kinds of use cases that were you know, never thought of before. So that, that's where we had it in terms of the use cases with WebRTC, yeah. uh, at least for this year. That's well, some brilliant examples, some that I've never even thought of. Um, and it kind of really shows kind of how far reaching this technology can be to all those different kind of areas that you mentioned. Um, um, but, but for me, the the big thing with, with this and the fact that we're still in like a sub 1.0 kind of state is um, kind of how how we are with with browsers and their implementations compared to the spec and the standardization around that because i suppose in a similar way we had a similar thing with web components right where um you know it seemed like it, it was a long time coming um but web components for at least part of it were, were relatively easily polyfilled um and I suspect that you know a lot of the web RTC technologies can't be polyfilled if we're talking about you know video encoding and audio encoding and all the other kind of stuff so I suppose I've got two questions really. First one is, is, is there a polyfilling story for WebRTC to any extent? Um, and, and, and then kind of, yeah, how, how are the different browser implementations um, synced up to the specification as it is now? So the cl closest thing that you have is Adapter.js. Uh, Adapter.js for many years now fills the gap between the differences of browsers in their behaviors. Okay, it can't fill things like a missing codec. So if it doesn't support H.264, it won't support H.264 anyway. But the basic stuff, you know, the name of the API, it returns a, the state is written slightly differently because one is already on the spec 1.0 version and the others are not yet, things like that. Uh, so if you took Adapter.js and get it up to date, you're, let's say, fine for the, uh, the basic use case of one-on-one -on -one video call, things like that will work. Once you go today to multi-party, to group calls, that's where you start getting headaches. The reason for that is that everything was called, or so-called thing, uh, use something that was called Plan B. Plan B is just how you um, express the channels that are going to open in this session, and how you're going to switch and replace them, okay? Now, in a large call, it, you need a lot of that happening because people join and leave all the time. And what happened is that Google used um, plan B, and then Firefox used the unified plan, and they didn't work well, and you need to implement both. At some point, it was decided within the W3C that the way to go is going to be unified plan. So everything is now moving and shifting towards unified plan. Now, the problem is that when everything runs using plan B because of Chrome, moving towards unified plan is going to just kill a lot of services on the internet if they don't upgrade. So we're at this you know, stage where these things are, are shifting towards this, uh, this new world. So it will take a bit longer to get there. By the end of this year, I think that these parts will be stabilized. Uh, the missing, let's say, the worrying part now besides that is the fact that Google changes almost every release something. So besides going to 1.0, they are doing things like optimizations. Last one that is ongoing today is changing the audio quality. They've done so by changing the threading model inside Chrome. Okay, it's a nasty thing. It's going to improve things, but you are going, you're changing the architecture inside a browser that a billion people use. Okay, they've replaced the echo canceller in the last release. And these things, again, here and there, you will find bugs because of that. Real bugs for real customers in production. And it's not fun. And it will continue because things progress and improve with WebRTC. From a non sort of calling standpoint, one of the more interesting things that I don't think it gets as much sort of, uh, let's say, call, let's call it press within the WebRTC side of life, uh, but is actually that you actually don't have to use web rtc for video and voice uh because you can use data channels for all kinds of interesting things do you mm -hmm. find that people are still using data channels uh, because yeah. i know for a long time when web rtc sort of 
first came around, there was the concept that, oh, well, RTC data channel will, will, can replace WebSockets and you can do nifty tricks with uh, RTC data channel to sort of uh, get rid of some of the burden that WebSockets sort of had a sort of borne down upon the platform, uh, which I never thought it was that burdensome, but that was just my opinion. Do you find data channel still pretty useful? People out there using it? Yes, but they're using it in different ways and you can't replace WebSockets with WebRTC data channels. It makes no sense. You can I never use thought them. so either. I, I, I'd heard that argument early on and I didn't make it's sense like, to me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's burdensome to use data channel to tell you the truth, okay? Because now instead of just, you know, connect, send, receive, which is, well, that's like three out of the four APIs that you have with the, um, with the WebSocket, okay? You've got these three and then 10 others for connecting a peer, using peer connection in WebRTC. So it's a lot more burdensome to use data channels in WebRTC, but you get something else. You get two things that Web that WebSockets don't have. The first is I can now send data directly across browsers. I don't need to go to a third server. And two examples or three exa examples for using it. The first one, WebTorrent, like BitTorrent, but on a web browser. Okay, there is a project called Web WebTorrent, for example. And most uh, torrent clients today also support the web torrent protocol. The second one would be peer assisted delivery for CDNs. You see CDNs today supporting this type of a capability. And now, if everybody is watching the same thing at the same time, they will start looking as if they are using web BitTorrent between them and not only picking the files from the CDN. So, this works very well when you've got peaks in usage. And the third one is when I want privacy. I don't want to send stuff to the server at all. I just want to do it, you know, peer to peer, from one browser to another with no traces other than the browsers. Um, the second reason you want a data channel is because you can make it unreliable. I will send data, but you might not receive it, which is fine. The reason for me to do that is because it lowers latency for sending that data. So now it can do things like remote controlling stuff or send data that is it's, it needs to be timely. Okay, telemetry and things like that. I can send using the data channel instead. Uh, the interesting part for me today is that you see today discussions and thoughts around using in, in data channel today in WebRTC uses a protocol called SCTP. Nobody knows what that is. It is used in you know, telecom, and that's about it. And now you have that in the browser, which makes it hard to use that to replace a WebSocket in front of a server, because now I need to find somewhere an implementation of SCTP for that. But there are discussions or talks around using QUIC instead. QUIC is going to be there in the browsers. It's going to be there as HTTP3. OK, we're going to see that running everywhere. And now if I can use that for the data channel or even for voice and video, that changes everything in terms of the complexity of the protocols that I have when I use something like WebRTC. So I think that's going to be a very interesting thing if it happens. Yeah, I, I think that would be interesting, um, particularly because I do, I, I, I'm trying to think of the difference of between SCTP and Quick, just in general, because and again, correct me if I'm wrong. SCTP is is ordered data delivery by default. Um, I presume that Quick would be as well, um, though I don't I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, but it is I, it is a I don't know. I always thought RTC Data Channel was relatively interesting. Um, is there is there has there been a lot of flex within the spec there? For RTC data channel, or, I mean peer peer connection, and obviously the codecs and everything else that are going on, or seem to be where most of the action is these days. But I'm always curious if data channels like, oh, we're still here, we're doing things. It's this, it's that. <laughs> most of the action is elsewhere, and for those that need it, they use it. Yeah, and I noticed that Intel had actually released their uh, their open suite or whatever uh, they're calling it these days uh, onto GitHub. Uh, their toolkit, sorry, not the suite. Um, the CS, the media server, something like that. Yeah, they yeah. they had they 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 pushed that stuff out 
host, mm-hmm. I think, the Leon get together, um, which is interesting. And again, like there there are lots and lots of tools out there for doing WebRTC stuff. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Like, there's no lack of them at this point. It's just no. trying to piece them together into something relatively usable seems not simplistic. I think that there is a lot of information out there. Some of it is outdated, which is a problem. You can never know if what you're reading, reading today is relevant or not. Uh, sometimes I read things that are really stupid. It happens. Uh, and then there is a lot of open source projects. And again, we don't know. And the problem is which ones are going to stay there, are going to be bought and taken off the market. Which ones you'll have the developers that have built it just leave it and let it die slowly. Uh, so there's a lot of you know alternatives, but you don't know what to use. I suppose that's a problem with kind of uh, you know early specs. We had a similar problem with our components, really. Um, you know that was changing as in flux for quite a long time. So it's very difficult to under- you know to find up to date up to date content online as to what to learn. You know, you'd people would be learning like the version version zero spec and not know the difference between V zero and V one. Um, um it all comes down to education, doesn't it? And and the community kind of trying to educate people as, as well as possible, updating their articles and those kind of things. But it is difficult for somebody coming to edit come at it from from you know from a kind of fresh perspective trying to figure out what it is that they need to learn. So kind of on that, do you have any any recommended resources or recommended places where you would say is, is always up to date, always has best practices, and, and is a great resource for learning? Well, first of all, my blog. That was like, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, if you're interested in WebRTC, then there is blog geek me. I write there once a week, a lot around WebRTC, not always, but a lot around WebRTC. Uh, there is the WebRTC Weekly that sends out an email of everything that happened in the market in the last week or so, links from the web. There is a great site called WebRTC Hacks. And WebRTC Hacks has in-depth um, write-ups around how to actually use WebRTC in specific things, and analysis, and uh, a lot of guest uh, articles there that are really good. And then... In terms of actually learning WebRTC, there is no good resource, not in a book and not in the web. There are a few courses, some of them outdated, some of them are not. And there is the course that I have, my course, which is called webrtccourse.com. It's a paid course, so you need to pay to enroll for it. But the first uh, module is free and it gives a very good introduction of WebRTC itself. So if you're looking for somewhere, let's say, to start your journey, Go to the robertccourse.com, take the first module, and then decide where you want to continue your learning, either there or elsewhere. I think in terms of keeping up to date with uh, kind of recent changes in the specs and those kind of things, do you do you share those in your weekly newsletter? Um, because obviously you've mentioned that you know, every Chrome update seems to break something around WebRTC. Of course, if you're building things with WebRTC, you need to be aware of these changes uh, and make sure that you can react to those changes in your kind of live applications. Is that the kind of details you share in that newsletter? So yes and no. I'll, you reminded me another another resource, by the way. There is Discuss WebRTC. It's a Google forum where People ask questions around WebRTC, but Google also posts there every PSA that they have about WebRTC. So the things that they know that they are going to break or change, they announce there. The important announcements, or important at least to my eyes, are the ones that will get into the WebRTC weekly. In the same way, things from Mozilla around Firefox or from Safari about WebKit and Microsoft around Edge will be found in the WebRTC weekly. So again, if you're looking for only one place to look, the place to look would be WebRTC Weekly for these updates. So, uh, so oh, sorry, go ahead, Leon. No, I was just going to say that that would be really useful. That sounds excellent. Sorry. No, we'll get those in the show notes as well, so that everyone has uh, you know the latest resources for sure. And you know, we talked a lot bit about Chrome, you know, breaking things because they're rapidly moving. Um, but one mm-hmm. thing they sort of rapidly moved towards that have been it's sort of planned for quite a while and you've kind of you you had mentioned plan b but uh the notion of moving to unified plan stp um which is sort of the trajectory of things 
Now, this has sort of happened in Chrome, but Safari just recently got experimental support, and I actually don't know about Firefox. I presume they were working on it as well. Sort of, what is sort of the unified plan SDP? What was that transition about? Uh, here, here's the thing. I don't really know. Uh, it's not that I don't. It's a, a fact of, it's a low-level thing that happens in how you express things within the SDP. How do you add and remove channels? Okay. And that was just change in the way, in the way you need to write an SDP. So up until that point, you had to use both plan B and unified plan. So you had two different ways of doing the same thing. And each browser needed his own implementation out of these two. So you can't really write an application that does both unless you start adding logic for both. But what happens if I have got Mozilla, by the way, Firefox started with unified plan or they were there first. So now I need to get cater for both for a call with four browsers, two of them Firefox, two of them Chrome. So the server now needs to start taking these SDPs and translating them from one browser to another, which is the sad part. Everyone now is moving towards unified plan and that's what people need to develop today towards. Do not think about plan B. In most cases, I would just pick an open source that does that. It's not one of these things that developers need to do today unless they are building infrastructure. Which sort of goes to the point about, you know, there are sort of a lot of different facets to sort of the WebRTC story. Because as you pointed out uh, earlier on, uh, some, of that, some of that spec is not indeed within the W3C. Uh, the unified plan was an IETF spec. Uh, or draft, it wasn't even a spec, it was a draft um, that sort of had been transitioned in. Uh, and you do have these different sort of players trying to make all these little things work so that, generally speaking, I can go into a browser, write some code, to hook all these things up. Um, th the fact that that continues to work just amazes me <laughs> because it is a very large surface uh where there are you know we talk about a lot about specs in general and how you know uh you know on the show how you know things happen on the web and how we get new fancy things but webrtc is really in a land of its own in terms of uh really the complexity and the amount of work and effort that went across a very wide span of yes. technologies very quick and frankly i think very quickly i realize it's been you know an ongoing thing for nearly a decade but uh, at this point, uh, I'm still just shocked that we're, we're we're to this point where we're having this phone call over WebRTC. I think <laughs> it's for a miracle. while it didn't look like it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think it's a miracle. Um, and again, I come from the video conferencing industry, so I know how things work there for developers, for you know, for product managers, and also from the politics behind that. There was no way that this could have gone this fast or we could have gotten to where we are today. It just, it, I don't know. It's a miracle. Not, nothing, nothing short of that. Well, there were so many walled gardens around this very concept, right? Like you didn't want, like interoperability was not a thing that necessarily companies wanted to sell on, right? You had XYZ conference subsystem. That was the thing that got installed. All your offices had that one thing. You didn't have a lot of crossover. Um, now you can kind of build your own, which again yeah. blows my mind. <laughs> yes, and it changed. It changed because yesterday we all talked about interoperability in the video conferencing world, how we're interoperable with everyone, but if you use only our stuff, it works better. Okay, today we, we talk about islands. It's like you want my service, you can use it everywhere. You know, we don't need to think about anything else. So, we're still not really interoperable with our products or services, but we rely on the interoperability of the browser to give us what we need to be able to cater for all devices and all users. That's the web 40, baby. <laughs> yep. Web for the win. See, we're, do we're doing things. The web is happening. <laughs> so on the, on the horizon of things, um, you know, what's the thing you want to see? What's the thing that you wish WebRTC did today that we just don't do yet? Where do you want it to go? More for the same, to tell you the truth. Um, there are two areas. There are three things that are interesting, okay? Or three things on the horizon of what's called 
WebRTC NV, the next version of WebRTC. I think that they are all very good approaches. The first one is saying, well, we can use Quick. I think that's a very interesting notion from an architectural point of view, not from the, you know, you won't be able to do new services with it, but it will just look better inside the browser when someone opens it up and looks at it just to see what happens there. Then there's this thing of let's connect WebRTC with WebAssembly. Okay, that's going to be really interesting. What are the things in WebRTC that we're going to open up so that developers can replace, change, modify, update, improve on, optimize, you know, pick your word. Um, and Google showed that in Cranky Geek last year. They showed how you can take something like RN noise, which checks if something is noise or not, noise or speech, okay, and use that inside the browser with WebRTC to decide if you're going to switch to the person because he's speaking or he's eating and you shouldn't, okay, or something fell from his hand. Something stupid like that, but you can do other things with it. And the third thing is how do you open up the media pipeline of WebRTC and enable doing things around machine learning with it? Object identification, things like speech to text and other analytics use cases. And these are, I think, the three areas that we will see a lot of moving forward. That's where I would like to see WebRTC going as well. So I, I like the trajectory or the discussion that are around the future. Yeah, I think opening it up to WebAssembly would have some some amazing kind of use cases. And, and yeah, I really like that. Again, not, not thought that at all, especially the AI side of stuff, you know, being able to access those video streams for object recognition, like you said, I think there's some some excellent use cases and also adding an, a huge layer of customizability to be able to really kind of take the WebRTC, WebRTC technologies and, and hone them to your very particular use cases. I think in industry, that could be really useful. Mm -hmm. I've, got a, you know, I've got an article just about that on my, on my site on WebAssembly and WebRTC and, you know, who wins, who loses, what can be done with it. Uh, cool. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, out, of, out of everything that we've talked about, do you think we've we've forgot to ask you anything, or is there anything else that you'd like to um, mention about WebRTC before we start to wrap up the show? Use it. Don't wait. If you think that you need something that WebRTC can offer, just don't wait for it to get stable or whatever. Just use it today, either directly or indirectly through a vendor that will do it for you or through a managed service. Don't wait. It's just it's a waste of time. This waiting, you are going to lose to someone else that is going to use it. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. We greatly appreciate it. I mean, it's always interesting to see what's going on with WebRTC. Thanks for having me. So, out there on the webs, where can people find you? Well, on my website, blogikme, um, in testrtc as well for testing and monitoring, and uh, I write in other places as well. So just you know. Search my name. There's only one of me out there with a name like mine. And we'll make sure to get all of those links in the show notes as well so people can, uh, uh, you know, hunt, uh, track you down and uh, find all the interesting things you're writing because you've, you, you've, you've been writing some great stuff on WebRTC and technology for a long time. So, we, I mean, we greatly appreciate it. I've read, I've read them for years. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Leon, any closing thoughts before we wrap up episode number 187 of the Web Platform Podcast? No, other than check out the resources that we'll add to these to the show notes. Um, there's some really good content in there, so definitely check that out. Fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode number 187 of the Web Platform Podcast. Uh, today we've been talking about WebRTC, all the great things on the horizon and all the things you can do today. Start using it. Trust me, you'll love it. Tune in next week when we talk more things web, more things platform. Have a great rest of your week.